<clears throat> Guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we discuss and build a better future. Today, we've got somebody who's doing that by looking at it in all the all the opposite ways, so to speak. Don Hoffman on the program. You guys probably remember. If you don't, check out episode 71, disruptors.fm. Search for Don. You'll find it there. And we dive into consciousness and much more. Thanks for coming back, Don. Thank you, Matt. Good to, good to see you again. So quick overcap, 30,000 foot view. Who are you and what have you been up to since we last talked? So I'm a professor of cognitive sciences at the University of California at, at Irvine. And uh, I've studied visual perception. Um, how do we see in 3D? How do we recognize objects? How do we perceive colors? And I've studied a little bit about artificial intelligence and robotic vision. And more recently, I've been studying the evolution of perception and asking the question, does evolution favor sensory systems that see reality as it is, or does it not favor them? And I'm most interested in consciousness and trying to get a mathematical model of consciousness. That's one of the biggest open problems in science right now is to understand all the data that we have about how consciousness is related to brain activity. We have, we have tons of data. The question is to get a scientific theory. So that's, those are the, the um, general topics that I've been involved in. And for the last uh, few months, since we talked last, I've been uh, doing the finishing editing on my book, uh, The Case Against Reality, which is coming out in August. And so that's taken a lot of work. And then writing a few papers about it, uh, an article coming out in The New Scientist and so forth about about the ideas. And then also in terms of basic research, working with, I have a wonderful team of, of researchers that uh, have backgrounds in mathematics, um, physics, uh, computer science, and cognitive science. And this team is working together to continue to develop the theory of, of consciousness, a mathematical model of consciousness that uh, I've been working on for a few years now with the team. So it's quite a challenge, but it's a fun challenge. And actually, we'll be meeting together for a long weekend in Half Moon Bay in about four weeks to, to you know, just have a powwow on that. So, yeah, those are the kinds of things I'm up to. A lot of fun. Basic research is a lot of fun. So a mathematical model of consciousness. Where did the, where did the idea, where did the motivation for this come from? Did you grow up religious? Was it something else? What made you want to explore this? <clears throat> Well, um, I, I did grow up in a religious family, um, and, and that may have had some influence on me being interested in this question. My dad was a minister uh, in a fundamentalist Christian denomination, and so I saw a lot of the Christian ideas, um, and they had their own ideas about, uh, you know, souls and so forth, not really about consciousness and, as a technical scientific thing, but more about souls. But on the other hand, I was looking at the research in artificial intelligence that I was doing and cognitive science and getting a very different uh, materialist look at consciousness. And the idea there is that somehow brain activity or embodied brain activity as the person interacts with the world is somehow creating or causing consciousness. And I think the impetus for me to try to get a mathematical model has been in the last 10 years or so, partly because remarkably, despite lots of effort, we don't have a good scientific theory of consciousness. In fact, uh, you know, most of my colleagues are trying to boot up consciousness from neural activity somehow. And we've not been able from that approach to even get a description of even one specific conscious experience, say, you know, the taste of vanilla or the feeling of velvet or um, the smell of garlic. We, we've not been able to say this brain activity and, and write it down with mathematical precision, this pre precise kind of brain activity or this kind of uh, you know, activity in an artificial intelligence system. So it doesn't have to be neurons, you know, this physical system with this kind of dynamical activity or causal structure must give rise or cause or be the taste of vanilla. It could not possibly be the smell of chocolate or the sound of a trumpet. It must be for these principal reasons um, that this brain activity or this circuitry activity in, in an AI system 
must be the taste of vanilla. That's what we want as scientists from a precise mathematical theory of consciousness. We don't want hand waves anymore. We want mathematical precision that says exactly which kinds of neural activity or silicon circuit activity must be specific kinds of conscious experiences. And right now, no one has a clue how to even start to do that. Uh, when you talk with all the, the leading theorists in this, in this field, for example, those looking at what's called integrated information theory, and you ask them, can you give a specific example of integrated information, causal structure that gives, that must be a specific conscious experience. Can you give me even one? They can't give even one. And so, so that's stunning. I mean, these people are very, very bright. There's no doubt about it. The researchers in this field are very, very bright. They know their neuroscience. They know a lot of mathematics, they know computer science. It's not for lack of training or intelligence. They're, they're really bright. And so that made me think, well, okay, Maybe we're being stymied because we're making some wrong assumptions. And these are going to have to be some you know, humdingers of assumptions that we're going to have to give up because there, there must be something that we deeply believe that's apparently deeply false. And so that's what I've been up to for the last 10 years or so is to try to, to sit back, look at what, what my colleagues in the cognitive neurosciences and AI are doing on consciousness and asking why. Why are we not making any specific concrete progress on getting a, you know, a scientific theory that makes mathematically precise predictions? This circuit, this dynamics must be the taste of chocolate. It could not be the smell of lavender. I mean, that's, that's what we want. If we don't get that, we're not there yet. So we have a clear target. And, and I'll just say one other thing about this. Some people have said, well, the interest of the field, especially in Western science, in the hard problem of consciousness, is really just an artifact of the influence of Descartes. Descartes, a few centuries ago, introduced the notion of dualism into Western thought, and the, the current work on the hard problem of consciousness, how is brain activity related to conscious experiences, uh, is just... Um, an artifact of this weird dualism that was introduced into our thinking and that other traditions, say Eastern mystical traditions that haven't had this dualist background, just don't have the hard problem of consciousness. And, and I, I think that's mistaken. I think once you understand the right way to think about the hard problem of consciousness, you realize it's not just a throwback to dualism. And, and here's how I, I frame it. We have tons of data that presents correlations between brain activity and conscious experiences. So for example, if I take a very powerful magnet called a transcranial magnetic stimulator, a TMS unit, and I touch it to a particular part of my skull, which is close to visual cortex area four, area V4 visual cortex. If I, just by touching it to my skull and inhibiting, you know, putting the magnet in inhibit mode, I can make it so that all color experience drains, while I'm watching, it drains away from my left visual field. And then when I turn the magnet off, all my color experience comes flowing back into my left visual field. If I do it to area MT on, on the right hemisphere of my brain, then I will lose all motion experience. All conscious experience of motion stops in the left visual field. I just see stroboscopic motion. Something's there, then there, then there, but no smooth motion. I turn off the magnet and my conscious experience turns back to nice, smooth motion. That's creepy as hell. It's, it's wild. It's, it's absolutely wild. And, and it, it's stunning data, right? And we have hundreds of examples like this of really tight correlations between brain activity or interventions in brain activity and conscious experiences. So the hard problem is very, very simple. Correlations are not a theory. Correlations are merely data. As scientists, we want a precise, a mathematically precise theory that explains all of these correlations. We can't do it. That is the hard problem of consciousness. The fact that the best and brightest among us, and, and, I, and my colleagues who are doing this are in, incredibly bright, so 
I mean, the fact that they're failing is not because they're not smart. They're very, very smart. The best and brightest cannot give us a mathematically precise theory that explains even one of these correlations precisely, much less all of them. That's the hard problem of consciousness. And you don't need to think about Descartes and dualism and history of Western thought to realize that this is an open and legitimate scientific problem that needs to be resolved. And for me as a scientist, <clears throat> there's another big aspect of this, and that is it's the big unsolved problems in science where you have the best chance of getting revolutionary new ideas that can break open whole new vistas in our understanding of the world and whole new areas of science. And so it's, not, it's the, the hard problems that we can't solve that the best and brightest have been looking at for, for decades or even centuries that we can't solve, those are the places that we should really focus as scientists because that's what we're gonna get. It may, it, may, it may hurt, we may have to let go of some very deeply held assumptions, but that's the point of these hard problems. They, they tell us eventually which of our deeply held assumptions are deeply false and we have to let go of them. For example, it used to be flat earth or geocentric universe. We used to believe the earth is the center of the universe because obviously the earth isn't moving. You can just, you can just see it. it doesn't move and everything is obviously going around us. And that was deeply false. It was deeply intuitive. Everybody believed it and it was deeply false. And so what we're going to have to do here is question some deeply held assumptions and let go of something, maybe more than one deeply held assumption, to try to solve this hard problem of consciousness. So that's why I'm, I myself am quite interested. You know, it, it's 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 big game, and if we can bring down this big game, we may learn a lot. So that's that's why I'm after it. Like Einstein with relativity, there's this one little thing that just doesn't quite work, and it changes everything. Do you th that's would right. you would you bet your life that this is something that's doable without a quantum computer? in terms of being able to understand some of the more dynamic interactions that go that may go into consciousness. I I'm betting my life because I'm spending my 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 time on this problem. So I'm betting my life that we that we can do this. Um, I'll give an argument against it and then my reaction. So so <clears throat> The one argument that would say we can't solve this problem is we don't expect uh, macaque monkeys to understand quantum mechanics. They, you know, they don't presumably have the concepts that are needed to understand quantum mechanics. I could be the most gifted teacher in the world and try to teach quantum mechanics to them. They'll never get it, not because I'm a bad teacher, but because they don't have the right concepts. And it's quite, one could argue that it's quite possible <clears throat> that Homo sapiens, our species, um, there's no reason why evolution should have shaped us um, with the concepts needed to understand objective reality. And, and so on those grounds, you might say it's a fool's errand to try to get a theory of objective reality um, and, and of consciousness. And we may not be able to do that. And I can't dismiss that argument. Um, it certainly is possible that we don't have the concepts. On the other hand, my attitude is um, we don't know unless we try. And so we have to give it the good old college try, use the concepts that are available to us and take our best shot at getting a theory of consciousness and, and of objective reality in which consciousness plays a role. Um, and I think that the problem is not that we lack the right concepts. I think the problem is much more mundane. We've just made some assumptions that are to us quite plausible and we've just not been willing to let go of some assumption that seems so plausible, but turns out to get in the way of solving this problem. And again, the assumption is going to have to be a humdinger because it's going to be something that we all dearly believe. And so it's going to seem nutty, whatever we have to give up. So I'm betting that it's that we can do it, but we have to be willing to let go of some deeply held assumptions to make progress on this. And that is going to be, the, the assumptions that we have to let go of are going to be stunning to us and counterintuitive. How do you think about psychedelics and turning off the default mode network and potentially some of our inborn filters? I know you focus quite a bit on filters in terms of yes. things that we do to be able to better function in society. Yes. Uh, I think that um, 
DMT, LSD, and various psychoactive drugs do seem to open us up to new aspects of conscious experience that we wouldn't otherwise have. Um, and I think that they're, they're the, the first tools that we might be developing toward exploring other forms of our own co possible conscious experiences. I think that they're, of course, fairly crude tools in, in the sense that um, it's more like, gee, let's try this and see what happens, right? It, it's not, we, we know that, that these chemicals act by, in many cases, binding to receptors at, at, at synapses and so forth. And we have some idea about the neurotransmitters that are involved in those systems and the ions that flow through the opening channels and so forth. And you might say, well, that's, that's really sophisticated knowledge, but, and it is, but it's still fairly trivial in terms of really understanding at a systems level what these, what these drugs are doing and why they would be opening up new realms of conscious experience. Part of the problem we have is the hard problem of consciousness, right? Until we understand precisely the relationship between neural activity and conscious experiences, we can't have an understanding of a deep understanding of how these psychedelics really open up new, you know, vistas of conscious experience. We can only sort of be experimentalists who say, let's try this, see what happens. Let's try that. Let's see what happens. But without a deep theory beyond, well, yeah, it binds to receptors and causes these neurotransmitters to flow. So I, I think that the, I mean, it's the, one of the best tools we have so far. And, you know, Michael Pollan's book is quite good in terms of, you uh, showing how exploration with this can really open up new, new, you know, levels of our own consciousness. What I found interesting is the research that's gone into early childhood trauma and how those impact individuals on a physical and mental basis. So it's not yeah. just, oh my God, you're crazy because your dad abused you and now you have a terrible life. It's fundamentally changing the wiring. But I wonder if it's changing the wiring or if it's also injecting some ghosts into the hardware, so to speak, when you see software that just has some strange glitchy bug, is there something like that in us that will make it more challenging to understand consciousness? Quite, quite possibly. And I, I've talked with people who have had childhood experiences and childhood problems resolved um, basically overnight by using uh, DMT, for example. And they, one, one person who had trouble with stuttering had it instantly, he, he said to me, I, I mean, I'm not saying I, we did a clinical study, but this was his own informal description to me, and I had no reason to disbelieve this person, that his stuttering was, was cured overnight. Um, he, he claimed that while he was in the state under the drug, he saw the stuttering as some big rock that was an obstacle to him. And he realized, oh, I can just walk around that rock. That, so that was what he consciously experienced during the trip. And after that, he just didn't need to stutter anymore. It was, it was gone. Now that's, you know, that's just, of course, that's not scientific data. That's just, you know, you know one in, interesting case study. But those kinds of case studies um, shouldn't be dismissed. We should. There's you know, a lot of them now. They're coming there's out. There's a lot of them. That's right. And so I think that they are saying that there is some deeper understanding that we need to have of human consciousness. Um, and you know, the, the fact that we don't have a mathematical model of consciousness is a huge problem for us because we have all this interesting data. We, we need a theoretical framework in which we can begin to understand these data and try to make predictions. And so, and, and you mentioned the default mode network and, and various other networks. It, it, it does seem that there are network systems of activity in the human brain. And when we're just sort of um, daydreaming or thinking about social phenomena, thinking about how we look to others and so forth, the default mode network is quite active. And when you start paying attention to some visual task or some auditory stimulus, you, you actually activate a visual attention network or an auditory attention network. And these networks, it turns out, seem to automatically inhibit the default mode network. It's 
They're, they have they have a mutual inhibition between these networks, and so for those of us who who you know maybe want to get out of our heads for a little bit, stop the 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 incessant thoughts. It turns out that paying attention to something visual is one way to automatically tamp down the activity of the default mode network. And so many meditative traditions have sort of experimentally you know discovered this kind of thing. But we now have some um, evidence from neuroscience that sort of backs these things up. But once again, as 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 great as all these discoveries are, it's we, we shouldn't pat ourselves on the back. We need a deep, mathematically precise, theoretical framework to understand consciousness and its relationship to brain activity, and we simply don't have that. And so we're still, despite all the data, we're groping in the dark. It's quite possible that the very basic ideas we have about brain activity and conscious experiences and, and the relationship could be fundamentally wrong. So I mean, we so that's so we you know fifty years from now, um, the textbooks might refer to this time as the dark ages in our understanding of consciousness and its relationship to the brain. They may laugh at the ideas that we were stuck with right now, and I think that that's probably the case. I think a big part of the problem would be looking at the brain as the brain and the center of consciousness. So there seems to be pretty compelling stuff that your gut and your mitochondria have at least very strong inputs into feelings, emotions, and what you end up doing. I would be curious to see how you tie different, or how people could tie different aspects of thought and emotion together. For instance, judges before lunch are in a much worse mood, so right. prisoner, prisoners get much longer sentences than they do after right. lunch. And the judge has no idea that that's what's happening, but it's their gut and their gut bacteria saying we want food now freaking feed us and we're going right. to be in a bad mood until then i i feel like everything's more dynamic and when we try to simplify things to a single specific equation so this is economics and this is math and this is science when we try to separate things is when we get ourselves in trouble i i absolutely agree <clears throat> i think that we're going to find that there's a far more organic and systemic totality that we have to understand when we understand human behavior and human emotions and human cognition. Um, the, the model of consciousness, in fact, that I'm working on entails exactly what you're saying, that, that, that consciousness is a multi-layered and complex evolving dynamical system. And it, so we can't just say, for example, that the standard view is that most of the brain processes are unconscious, but there's just a few in that, that somehow um, give rise to the magic of consciousness. And I think it's far more organic than that. Um, and we can go into it if, 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 if you want. But, I, I, but, but yes, I agree with your, your point that um, it's, it's going to be a more integrated whole that we have to look at. Um, than perhaps we originally thought. And that makes the problem much more difficult, but also much more intriguing and exciting. <clears throat> do you think consciousness is a thing or do you think it's just the reaction to a subconscious process? So X, Y, Z happened. And so I was thirsty. I reached for the cup. Oh, I'm thirsty. I should reach for the cup. Oh, shoot. I already started reaching for the cup. There's been a lot of experiments like that showing that people's perception or people's decision to do something happens after they've started doing it. That's right. So the, the data are very, very clear. In, in carefully controlled experiments where you have a person make a simple decision, like press the button on the left versus the button on the right. And just, you know, whenever you want to make a choice about which button you're going to press and, and then keep track of this clock. There's a hand on a clock moving around. Whenever you feel that you've made your choice, just remember where the hand on the clock was pointing, what number, so we can know when you felt like you made the conscious choice. And you do these experiments repeatedly, and what you find is, by measuring EEG or other forms of brain activity, the experimenter can predict up to seven seconds ahead of time, what the person's choice is going to be seven seconds before they say that they were conscious of the choice that they were going to make, that they, that they had now made the choice. Seven seconds. 
Now, the standard interpretation of those data are that brain processes that are unconscious, um, in the sense that there's just no consciousness at all associated with them, um, are the real causal engine here. They're the real thing that's doing the work. And they make the decision. And your conscious experience, in some sense, is a latecomer. It only, it only gets informed later on, a few seconds later, about what the, the hardware of the brain had decided. And, and then the consciousness then sort of uh, takes the credit for it and says, I made that decision when in fact it's just, uh, you know, along for the ride. That's the standard theory. I, I disagree with that theory from start to finish. Um, although the, the experimental data are absolutely as, as, as I described. So the brain activity is clearly allows prediction ahead of time. So it's going to require a, a very, very novel framework to account for those data um, and, and to escape the idea that unconscious brain processes cause our conscious our, our choices. So, so the framework that I'm working on, and, and, and this takes a minute because I'm gonna now be challenging assumptions that we deeply hold. Go for it. So yeah, so one assumption that we deeply hold is that we see reality as it is. If I see an apple, I'm not seeing all of the truth, but I am seeing truly that there is an object with that shape and that color and that distance from me. And <clears throat> if I see the moon, I'm not making up the moon, I'm seeing a, a big chunk of rock that would exist even if I weren't looking. So we believe that our senses tell us truths about a real space-time reality that has real physical objects in it. And the reason that most of my colleagues give from science for believing that is an argument from evolution. <clears throat> that basically those of our, that, that seeing reality accurately makes you more fit. If you have two, two organisms, one that sees reality as it is, at least to a good degree, and another one that doesn't, then clearly the argument goes, the organism that sees reality more accurately will be more fit and more likely to survive and pass on its genes. And of course, you don't need to see all of reality, just the aspects of reality that uh, you need to stay alive. <clears throat> so I don't need to see neutrinos and pi mesons and all that stuff, but I do need to see apples and the moon and mountains and so forth. And so I see the aspects of the truth that I need to see. And so working with some colleagues, I first questioned that assumption. Does evolution by natural selection really favor organisms that see reality as it is? And the answer is absolutely not that organisms that see reality as it is are never more fit than organisms of equal complexity that see none of reality and just focus, their, their senses just focus on what are called fitness payoffs. Uh, and that's a stunning result, um, but it's, it's a mathematical result that follows from evolutionary game theory. So, so evolution by natural selection is a mathematically precise theory now. We have the tools of evolutionary game theory that were introduced in the 1970s by a, a mathematician named John Maynard Smith. And using the replicator equation and, and the whole framework of evolutionary game theory, we can actually prove that um, the probability is zero um, that an organism that sees reality as it is will be more fit than an organism of equal complexity that sees none of reality. And is just their, their senses just report fitness payoffs. And the idea of fitness payoffs, I mean, is important. Think, you can think of evolution by natural selection like a video game. If you're playing a video game, um, you, you, know, you have to focus on getting points as fast as you can. And if you get enough points in a short enough time, you might get to the next level. Otherwise, you die and you have to start over. And 
if you do anything but focus on getting those points while you're playing the video game, good luck, you're probably going to die. So you really have to focus uh, on getting those points. Evolution by natural selection is very much the same way. It's, it's like a game. You're collecting fitness payoffs. And if you get more fitness payoffs than your competition, then the equations of natural selection say that you have a much better chance of passing on your genes, which code for your strategy for collecting those fitness payoffs. Fitness payoffs are things like, you know, getting food that you need to stay alive, avoiding predators, and finding um, good mates. So these are the kinds of things that, that offer fitness payoffs. Basically, it's like taking a painting where you're doing a where's Waldo and making everything blurry except for Waldo. Right. Where Waldo is the fitness payoffs. And you need to focus only on finding those fitness payoffs. If you do anything else, for example, looking for the truth, then you're playing the wrong game. It's, it's like someone um, who's playing chess but hunting for pawns instead of the king. Well, they're going to lose. They're, they're playing the wrong game. Someone who hunts the king is going to beat them over someone who's you know, hunting just pawns. And so hunting the truth is playing the wrong game. And, and so, of course, this raises the question, okay, well, how could, if, if our senses have evolved not to show us any truths, and I, I'm, I'm literally saying we see no truths about objective reality. Space-time itself is not objective reality. Space-time is just a data structure that we use to represent fitness payoffs and how to get them. Physical objects like an apple or a tree, these are not pre, we're not, when we perceive an apple, we're not perceiving a pre-existing object and just having perceptions that sort of match that real object. It's more, think of it in terms of computer science. We're creating a data structure on the fly that re reports to us fitness payoffs and actions that we need to take to get those fitness payoffs. So we create that data structure, we call it a red apple. And when I look at the red apple, I create that data structure. When I look away, I garbage collect that data structure. I throw it away to save memory. And now I look over here and there I see, uh, you know, uh, a stake. So that's another data structure that I've created. Or I look over there and I see a tiger. That's a data structure that tells me certain other things. Don't try to eat it. Maybe try to stay away from it. I mean, so each data structure that I create is just a, you know, I call them physical objects, but they're just data structures that we create on the fly to represent fitness payoffs. Now, by the way, that's an interesting technical challenge that's not been solved to show that what we call physical objects are satisficing solutions to a technical problem given the, all the different fitness payoff functions that an organism has to deal with to stay alive and realizing that even the fitness payoff functions themselves are over, have overwhelming amount of data in them. You can't even pay attention just to all the fitness payoffs. It, it would overwhelm you. So you have to data compress all those fitness payoffs down to an essential core that tells you this is the most important fitness information and these are the most important actions that you could take. And that's the solution to that problem is what we call physical objects inside of space-time. So thinking of physical objects and space-time itself as solutions to a computational problem is going to, I think, blow things wide open for us. So that's, that's the framework I'm proposing. And so the big idea is that everything that we see, space-time and physical objects, is just a user interface. It's like the desktop interface on your computer. So if you're, if you're, um, if you're writing a novel and the icon for your novel is you know blue and rectangular in the middle of your desktop does that mean that the novel itself that you've been working on for a year is blue and rectangular and in the middle of your computer now, of course not and anybody who thought that is missing the whole point of the desktop interface the, the the interface and its symbols are not there to show you the truth which in this metaphor is the circuits and voltages and software the interface is there specifically to hide that truth and to give you eye candy that lets you control the truth even though you're completely ignorant. Most of us have no idea how the circuits and voltages and software work inside a computer. We don't need to know it and we're grateful not to know it because we have this simple icons on our desktop and that's what evolution did for us. Evolution 
gave us an interface, not a window on truth. Absolutely not a window on truth. It's an interface. So three-dimensional space, as you perceive it, is your three-dimensional desktop. And physical objects like the moon or apples or tigers are merely icons, three-dimensional icons in your, your interface. And the point is not to show you the truth, but to hide the truth. With that framework, though, I wouldn't see anything that wasn't worth seeing. But I see a lot of things that aren't worth seeing. They're not directly leading to fitness payoffs. My walls are slightly off-white. But if they were to just be any color, it really wouldn't matter all of that much. Aren't you able to push back against a theory like that by pointing out that clearly there are things that serve no purpose to see or to hear or to smell? Well, that's a, that's a great point. It's the, the idea would be that we have evolved an interface which tries as best as possible, evolution has tried as best as possible to give us something that gives us only the essential information. Um, and doesn't give us unessential information. And so in the case of, of like the wall and the color of the wall, what we have is a tool that's been evolved. Color turns out to be a tool that we can use to make a lot of fitness-based predictions, like the color of a fruit. If, if the apple is, is green, you know, if it's a, a red delicious apple and, and it's green, you know that you, you probably shouldn't be eating it yet. So it, it tells you something about, about that. So we have that tool. When I see a wall, I am getting fitness information. I know I can't walk through it. If I hit it with my fist, I'm going to be in trouble. Uh, there, uh, if I try to eat that wall, I'm going to be in trouble. So I am getting a lot of important fitness information. Um, but here's the kinds of information we throw away. Um, for example, in the case of space itself, what is depth? From this point of view, depth is really a data structure that tells us the amount of calories you're going to have to spend to get certain fitness payoffs. So an apple that I see is only uh, you know, three feet away isn't going to cost me a lot of calories to get the fitness points of eating that apple. An apple 30 meters away is going to cost me quite a few more calories to get those calories. So in some sense, distance is a way, distance in space is uh, serving as a, a measure of the calories or per percent of total calories that are available to me, probably more likely. It's what fraction of my total reserve of energy would I need to expand to get that? And so one prediction of that is uh, quite, quite interesting. If you, if you look at the, um, like, you see some, some mountains maybe 30 miles away, 20 miles away, and you see the moon rising behind those mountains. Well, if you look, um, the moon looks about the same distance from you as those mountains. Maybe it looks a little bit further, but, but not much. Um, but in fact, the distance from the you know, to the mountains is trivial compared to the distance from the moon. It's a quarter million miles away. Why, why is it that we say that they're about the same distance? Well, because our perception of distance isn't about truth. It's about the caloric resources that would be needed to get there to get fitness payoffs. And in both cases, the, the answer is the caloric resources are about infinity. It, it, it's all that 100% of your resources would be needed to get there. And so, so we sort of um, code distance by um, the information needed to understand the calories we would expend. So, so I think that we, I mean, that's, that's a great, great question, but I think that we'll find is, is that things that, are, that most of the time, things that we think are perceptions that aren't really very useful for our fitness will, will turn out to be. Um, but the idea then is, is that space and time and physical objects aren't objective reality and that the perception that we have of cause and effect in space and time, the idea that physical objects have genuine causes, that if I, you know, hit the cue ball and it strikes the eight ball and sends the eight ball careening into the corner pocket, that the cue ball somehow caused the motion of the eight ball, that that is just a user interface fiction. 
Um, it's just like if you're playing, for example, suppose you're playing uh, a, a souped up virtual reality version of Grand Theft Auto. And you see a steering wheel, a black steering wheel, and it's in the lower left corner of your, you know, your field of view. And you say, well, look, the steering wheel, if I turn it to the left, my car will turn left. So clearly my steering wheel has genuinely caused my car to turn left. And if I turn the steering wheel right, my car goes to the right. So clearly my steering wheel really can cause the car to, to move. And of course, for someone who's playing the game, I'm just trying to win in Grand Theft Auto, that's, that's perfectly fine. That, that, that's a harmless assumption. But if you're a software designer and you're trying to get the next, build the next version of Grand Theft Auto, if you really believe that there's this real steering wheel with real causal effects, good luck. I mean, that's so, it's so wrong that you won't be able to write the software. The steering wheel is just a useful fiction. Um, and the real cause and effect in this metaphor is all the circuits and software in the, the computer that's running the, the Grand Theft Auto software. And that's what's going on, I claim, about space and time and physical objects. There is a reality behind space and time that has the true cause and effect. Objects, physical objects in space and time have only a fiction of causality. It's a useful fiction for most purposes. It's, it's harmless for us to believe that, you know, you know, throwing a rock at a window caused the window to break. It's a useful fiction, but it's strictly speaking false. And this is now where it gets back to the hard problem of consciousness. It's a long route to get back to why we've not been able to solve the hard problem. We've assumed that neurons exist and have causal powers, whether or not they're perceived. And I'm saying that that assumption is false. That the assumption that physical objects like neurons or the moon exist even if no creature perceives them and have causal powers, that is the assumption that's false. And I told you it would have to be a humdinger. <laughs> that, that's a humdinger of an assumption to, to let go of. It's something that we all deeply believe, and I'm saying it's deeply false. What would make this different than a simulation theory? So I am actually just a character playing in a virtual reality. So it's that seems it's, much that seems much more possible because it's much more likely in the future that beings would create simulations so that they could either enjoy them or run simulations of specific things. And if we have infinite time essentially going forward, we'll have infinite simulations. Right. The, the, so the difference between what I'm saying and the simulation theory is that when you look at, for, for example, Nick Bostrom and others who, who have proposed this, they propose that there is at the base of all these simulations, some base level where the first program is being written. Right. And when you look at what they're claiming about the reality of that base, it's a physical reality. There is a space time, there, is, there are real physical objects, there's a real computer with real chips at the base level. And the rest of us, of course, are all, are all virtual. And, and the argument is, if you look at the probabilities and you ask, are we at the base level or not, the, the chances are overwhelming um, that we're not at the base level. So we're, we're all virtual. So that, that's one difference, is that they're claiming that space-time and physical objects are still fundamental at the base level. And the second difference is this they still have the hard problem of consciousness. They still have the problem of how can software running on circuits create conscious experiences or the illusion of conscious experiences? I have a headache or I smell chocolate or I feel velvet. I'm just a simulation. Well, it's not enough just to say I'm, I'm a simulation we need then a scientific theory that says exactly how a software program running on say silicon circuits or whatever could create consciousness and there's no story about that so the simulation theory founders on the hard problem of consciousness it has a big problem there that, that, that has to be solved so in, in the end of the matrix you find out that it's just another simulation and they're trying to figure out how difficult do we make this so the humans are stupid enough to stay involved uh, and if I think about a simulation theory, 
what's the best way to get someone absolutely convinced that something is real so that they don't question reality is to give them a problem they're not equipped to solve, but they feel as if they can, which would be consciousness. So then you have a situation where humanity doesn't try to get out of simulation. It doesn't check out because this does feel real. And this is our one true flag that points to the fact that this is reality. Right. Well, I, I, I like that idea. And if that were the case, then I would say that the best way that we could rebel would be to keep fighting to try to get that theory of consciousness, to not give up. Um, but if you, we, you, you, can, you can code, you can, I mean, you can code something that has no answer. What? Right. So it creates a, it creates a, a dilemma, a dichotomy. I'm not saying necessarily this is what I believe. I don't, sure. I, don't, I don't believe this, and I also don't believe your theory. I think what's much closer to the truth would be that we're living in a world where we do have filters to optimize for certain things. So okay. for instance, I don't notice the shade of the wall. I don't notice the texture of the carpet. It's similar to when you're having a dream. There are certain details that you leave out. When you're super focused on something, you're plugged into it and zooming other things out. And I would say that that, I haven't tried psychedelics, I would love to. But it's one of those things where you can also have a bad trip and go uh, and go AWOL, so to speak. So I haven't, right. I haven't gone for it quite yet. But it's one of those things where I feel like humanity has a lot of filters built in. So there is potentially something else out there in terms of experiences. It probably has to do with a multiverse where we're living in continuously growing, essentially quantum simulations, although they don't have to be simulations. They can be realities. But that... We experience our our four D essentially world as it is, with certain caveats added on to that. What and I don't see why you would have to have something. I don't see why you would have to be completely at one end of the spectrum or the other. For instance, not seeing reality a hundred percent as it is, or seeing reality a hundred percent as it is. I don't see why something in the middle wouldn't optimize better than something on either end. Well, there's part of what you're saying that I completely agree with, which is that there are probably a, a large, perhaps infinite variety of different modes of conscious experience. And our normal everyday mode is just one. And we probably are filtered away from lots of other nearby experiences um, and that are that are you know quite different from what we call normal everyday experience and and in fact the the theory of consciousness that i'm working on with with my collaborators um it basically says that objective reality is a vast social network of interacting conscious agents where each conscious agent could have a different forms of conscious experiences than we've ever had as human beings. So there's an infinite variety of conscious experiences and experiencers out there. And the human form of experience is just one of, if you will, a multiverse of different kinds of conscious experiences. And so the idea there is, think about it as like Twitter, the vast social network of Twitter. There are tens of millions of users billions of tweets, lots of stuff trending. As a Twitter user, if you're trying to understand what's going on, it's overwhelming. You can't possibly look at all the tweets. You can't possibly follow all the 10 million Twitter, 10, tens of millions of Twitter users. So what, what can you do? Well, you can build visualization tools. That's what we do whenever there's big data, especially social um, network data. We build visualization tools which throw away most of the information and keep only the essential information and compress it into a simple format that we can understand, a visualization tool. Now, and using the tool, I can see what's trending in Atlanta, I can see what's trending in Irvine and, and so forth, or whatever it is that I need to do. And the point is this, what we see in the visualization tool is just a visualization tool. It's not the network, right? The colors and shapes and so forth that we see in the tool are in some sense um, data compressing simplifications of abstract properties of the network that are important to us. And I'm saying that's what space time and physical objects are. We are all conscious agents. 
in a vast network, uh, an infinite network of conscious agents, we, to not be overwhelmed, we need a visualization tool. Our visualization tool is what we call space, time, and physical objects. It's a tool that we're using as a way to interact with something that is not in space and time, uh, it, this vast network of conscious agents. Conscious agents themselves don't have a shape, they don't have a color, uh, they don't have a position in space. Space is just the visualization tool we use to interact and to interface with that vast social network. And so it's in that sense, Matt, Matt that I'm thinking that the visualization tool, I mean, it, it, in some sense, is telling us truths about reality. It's telling us, you know, abstractly, what, what are the important social, what are the hubs in the social network, for example? What are the minor points that we should ignore and so forth? It's giving us truths in that sense, but, but the space-time data structure itself is literally just a convenience. And physical objects that we see are just literally a convenience. They're telling us abstract properties about this network of conscious agents. So there is information about this network, but the format of our interface, if we take it literally, we're going to be misled. We'll agree to disagree on this one. Sure. So thoughts on quantum, <laughs> quantum interpretations of consciousness. What about the quantum interpretations? In terms of, I've kind of seen two, two ways that this goes. It goes where you have really well-established, respected scientists and um, physicists especially, looking at potential implications as we get down to subatomic scale on how different quantum interactions can be potentially causing consciousness. And then you also see kind of emerging with a more woo-woo side of things, which I'm not sure I can completely align with. But what are your thoughts on the potential that quantum computing or quantum dynamic properties are a big part of consciousness and how we perceive the world? Uh, when you look at things from the quantum point of view, it's quite interesting. One question is, what are quantum states? Like the, the wave function in quantum mechanics. The Schrodinger equation describes the evolution of wave functions. And what, what are these wave functions? There are two main interpretations of the wave function. One is an ontic interpretation in which the wave function is telling you the true state of the objective world. And the other is a subjective or you know, epistemic view, where, where you say the wave function is just an agent, an experimenter's subjective degrees of belief about what they could see, what measurement outcomes they could get if they do a certain experiment. And my own view is that the quantum wave function is specific to each observer, to each agent that's doing an experiment, and is just a description of the degrees of belief. I also, and th this is now, uh, I'll tell you, not my theory, but a theory that um, several hard-nosed quantum physicists are saying. In particular, Nima Arkani Hamed, who's at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, David Gross, who won the Nobel Prize for his work on the Standard Model, and Ed Witten, who's you know, a field medalist and, and uh, has, has worked quite a bit on string theory. What, what, what these guys all say, and this is the quote, space-time is doomed. And they say you know, that for the following reason, space-time has been assumed to be the fundamental structure in physics since at least Newton for many, many centuries. And physics as a discipline has been the study of what happens inside space and time. But now they're realizing that we have to let, space-time has had a good run. It's been a really helpful framework, but it's wrong. It's not fundamental. We have to let go of space-time. We have to find some deeper reality and some deeper description of reality that's that, and space-time will have to emerge somehow from it. Space-time is not fundamental. Here's a couple of the reasons why. And, and if, if anybody who wants to, you know, check on this, if you just Google Nima Arkani Hamed, A-R-K-A-N-I-H-A-M-E-D, there's a dash between Arkani and Hamed. 
and just Google his name and Space Time is Doom. You can see him talk on, on at, for example, the Cornell Messenger lectures. I would recommend as as a way to see what he's saying here. He gives a couple reasons from quantum mechanics why we have to let go of space time. One is that if you try to measure smaller and smaller distances within space time, according to quantum mechanics, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you're going to have to use higher and higher energies. And that's fine. You can just keep, in principle, you would think you could just keep going and using higher and higher energies, um, and you could measure smaller and smaller in, in, in space time. It turns out there's a limit. At some point, when you get to a high enough energy, the energy is so concentrated in such a small area of space that you create a black hole. You destroy space. And if you say, well, I'll just try harder, I'll put more energy in there, the black hole just gets bigger and bigger. And Arkani Hamed says, look, if in principle, space-time is not something that we can measure with arbitrary precision, then it's not fundamental. There's something else that's fundamental. But what we found repeatedly in physics is if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. It's not fundamental. There's something deeper. But then there's an even better bit of, of argument that he gives from the experiments of the Large Hadron Collider. The argument there is what they're doing is they're taking protons, to, you know, two protons, spinning them at the speed of light and smashing them into each other. And so what you, what you have to do is look for what they call the, the scattering events, like two gluons hit each other and four gluons go spraying out. And you need to compute the probabilities of these scattering events. They're called scattering amplitudes. So you, you can do this. Feynman showed us how to do this using Feynman diagrams inside space-time where you, you know, assert that space-time is real and that unitary dynamics of, of particles inside space-time is the real dynamics. Then Feynman diagram says all these virtual particles that you have to compute and how they interact and so forth. And when you do the math, it turns out you'll get for, for very simple scattering events, you'll get a hundred pages of algebra that you have to compute to actually get the, the probability, the scattering amplitude. And it goes up to a thousand pages for more complicated um, scattering events. And in the, in the colliders, you'll be doing billions of these collisions per second. And you're trying to get rid of most of them. You're trying to find them and get rid of them because we already know about this stuff. We're looking for that, you know, the little, you know, diamond in, you know, in the mud, in, in all the mud there, that's the new, the new data. So it turned out 30 years ago, I mean, this was a huge problem. Uh, the math is too complicated. Supercomputers can't do it. So the experimentalists asked the theorists, please, please, can you simplify this math? We, 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 our experiments can't be done with the current theory that you've given us. So some mathematicians worked on it, and it seemed almost like magic. They turned 100 pages into a single term that you could compute by hand. And everybody's going, holy smoke, is this just a one-off? And it turns out repeatedly that they could, in every single case, turn hundreds of pages of nasty algebra into one or two terms that were trivial to compute. And so they began to look at this and they discovered a couple things. First, all of this new approach that simplified things was pointing to symmetries, a deep symmetry in nature that cannot be expressed in space-time. It's a Mul symmetry outside of space-time. Multiverse? That would they be don't symmetries. Know. I mean, th this is really the cutting edge right now. They, they don't know what this deeper space is. But it's not space-time. And second, what they were doing that let go, uh, that, that made it, simple is they no longer enforced space-time in all the virtual particles that you have to have if you say that space-time is fundamental reality. When you let go of space-time, you let go of all the, all the virtual particles that are in the Feynman diagrams and all the complexity goes away and you still get the right answer. So here's, here's what they're saying. 
if you let go of space-time, you see deeper symmetries that can't be expressed in space-time, and the mathematics that says there's a simple reality at the deeper level, if you force yourself to stay inside space-time, the math gets ugly, you create all these virtual particles that aren't there, and you cannot see these deeper symmetries in nature. I'm saying this fits exactly with the interface idea that I'm proposing. I, I'm saying space-time is doomed. Space-time is not fundamental reality. It's merely a data structure that, our, that Homo sapiens happens to use to represent fitness payoffs and the costs involved in getting fitness payoffs. Now physicists are saying space-time is doomed. There's a deeper reality. Now, my proposal for this deeper reality is that it's this vast social network of interacting conscious agents. Um, that's not what, by the way, now that's, the physicists themselves are not saying that. That's where uh, I'm saying something new. But the other stuff is not new. Space-time is doomed is what Nima Arkani Hamed is saying, David Gross, and Ed Witten. And for the reasons that I've just given, to really understand the scattering amplitudes at the Large Hadron Collider, we have to let go of space-time. It's had a good ride. It's been a real useful tool for centuries. It's gone past its usefulness. It's time to get a deeper structure, and they don't know what it is. So, my, so in, that's a long answer to your question about quantum theory. I, I think that quantum theory is telling us two very profound things. Space-time is doomed. And second, when space-time is doomed, that means all of the contents of space-time go with it. I mean quarks and gluons and fundamental particles. Those are all perturbations of fields within space-time. When space-time goes, those particles go as well. Those were only interface descriptions. There's a deeper reality that we have to go after. Particles themselves are not the final reality, and they have no causal powers. So literally, so I want to say space-time is doomed. All objects within space-time are doomed, and that means that no object in space-time is real. <laughs> it's only emergent, and it has no genuine causal powers. It's profound. This is, this is the assumption that I'm claiming we have to let go of, that space-time is real, physical objects are real, and they have genuine causal powers. That is the, the assumption that we all deeply believe, and that's the one I'm saying is deeply false. And until we let go of it, we will not make progress in understanding consciousness. I would say you can let go of it without letting go of the observations, because the observations are going to be representative of something else. For instance, are quarks and gluons actually some other form of interaction that's happening in another dimension? Absolutely. I completely agree with you, Matt. So, so let me be very, very clear how I agree with you on that. When I say that space-time is doomed and that in some sense all of our theories within space-time can't be right because we're assuming that physical objects exist and have causal powers, right? What I'm saying is we're going to have to have a deeper theory. I'm proposing a network of conscious agents. Of course, I'm probably wrong but I'm trying to be mathematically precise. And my, my colleagues and I have published a couple scientific papers. It's all mathematics, and we're looking at the dynamics of this network of conscious agents. And here's the kicker. What we have to do is take this dynamics of conscious agents, project that dynamics back into the space-time interface of Homo sapiens. And when we do that, it better look like evolution by natural selection, general relativity, and quantum field theory. If it doesn't, then our dynamics in, of conscious agents is wrong. And we'll have to tweak that dynamics until the theory of conscious agents that we get, when we project it into space-time, gives us back all of the scientific theories that we know and love within space-time. So I'm saying this, science so far has not yet dealt with objective reality. No scientific theory has dealt with objective reality. All of our scientific theories have been theories of the interface and how our interface behaves. We've all had only interface theories. For the first time, we can get scientific theories. I'm proposing, again, I'm probably wrong, but at least I'm mathematically precise. I'm proposing objective reality as this vast network of conscious agents. 
the reason it's science is not just that I've had mathematical precision, but what uh, the constraint on me is when I project my dynamics of conscious agents into space time, I have to get back the science that we've already gotten, the scientific theories that we've already gotten, or hopefully generalizations of them that, that you know, maybe, maybe I can get the, the, the long sought for um, quantum gravity theory that gets general relativity and quantum, you know, the standard model to work together. Um, but at least I need to get our current scientific theories, general relativity, quantum field theory, evolution by natural selection, as projections of the dynamics of conscious agents. If I can't do that, I'm wrong. So I am doing science in the sense that I can tell you exactly what I need to do uh, to be right, or at least uh, I'll tell you what, what, what you can do to show me wrong. Put it that way. Here, here's what you can do to show me wrong. That's the best science can ever do. Right, right. You can't show that you're right. Just show that you are wrong. Which kind of implies it may be turtled all the way down. You know, I can't dismiss that possibility. Um, it's, it's certainly there, but I think, Matt, that as scientists, we have to, we, it's quite possible, as we talked about earlier, that it's, it's impossible for science to get a model of reality because we don't have the concepts needed to do that. It's certainly possible. Um, but that's not a good working hypothesis, right? It's, just, it's not good for science. You, if you, from the get-go, say, well, we can't do this, well, then why bother? Maybe we do have the concepts needed. Let's give it the good old college try and, and, and go down trying. You know, maybe we won't be able to do it, but we should go down trying as opposed to just giving up, is my attitude about it. Amen. I would definitely go along with that. I want to jump into the, the patron-only bonus round now. You ready? Sure. And for listeners, if you go to disruptors.fm slash Patreon, we throw three to four epic bonus questions with every guest to support us at a level of $5 or more per month so we can make it sustainable. And you will access that bonus episodes and some other fun stuff. Let's do it. And we are back from our first ever Disruptors bathroom break. This has been quite a long and quite a fun one. If you guys are experiencing reality in any way, you may also have to pee. And if you do, you've got the pause button. So Don, I got two last questions for you. First, okay. you, you have an interesting term. I'm not sure if you coined it or where it came from, but neurotheology. Explain. Ah, uh, yes. Um, there's been a long history of debate about whether science should talk about religious issues, whether we should talk about morals and right and wrong and good and evil and so forth, or whether that's the just outside the domain of science and that should be left to you know, various uh, religions and so forth. And it's been a debate. Um, Stephen Jay Gould, for example, argued that uh, there were separate domains and science has its domain and religion has its domain. And, and others like um, Dawkins um, say no, when religions make existence claims, um, they're treading on the turf of science, and so the two need to, need to interact. And on this, I agree with Dawkins. I, I think that there's not separate domains, that the questions that, that religious traditions, spiritual traditions are asking are important. Why are we here? What's the meaning of life? What happens when we die? What's good? What's bad? Why is there pain? These are, these are big, big questions that all of us as human beings um, are, are, are very, very interested in understanding. They're very, very personal and very important. And my attitude is why shouldn't we use the best tools of inquiry that humanity has ever discovered to try to address these questions, namely the, the tools of science. We can also address these questions with meditation and discussions and so forth as the spiritual traditions do. But what about making mathematically precise proposals and doing experiments to test them? So the theory of conscious agents that I've been working on has an interesting prediction. It says that when two agents interact, they can form a new higher level agent. And this process can go on ad infinitum. So the smallest agents, in my theory, 
have are what I call one bit agents. They only have like two possible perceptions. So it's just one bit of information in their perceptions. They can interact and form a four bit agent or an eight bit or, but it can go up to agents that are infinite. And when we start talking about infinite conscious agents, now we're talking about something that treads on the turf of spiritual traditions, right? Infinite consciousness is what many traditions would call God or Brahman or, or whatever. <clears throat> and so, but the nice thing is, again, I'm probably wrong, but I'm mathematically precise. And so I can make mathematically precise proposals about the dynamics of infinite consciousness and how it's related to finite consciousness is presumably like us. In other words, I can actually do a neurotheology. I can actually have a mathematically precise definition of an infinite consciousness, discuss its properties, prove theorems about an infinite consciousness, prove theorems about its relationship to finite consciousnesses, and how much, and, and maybe even prove theorems about how much we can know or how much we can interact with the infinite consciousness. And, and again, of course I'm probably wrong, but the point is I'm precise. So for the first time in human history, we can take these kinds of questions that are very important to us, and for the first time, we can actually be wrong. Our, our, our theories have never been precise enough even to be wrong. So, we, so we, we haven't even been wrong yet. So I'm, I'm going to be the first person maybe in human history to be wrong about these, these questions about spirituality. But the point is you have to start off being wrong before you can try to evolve a theory that might have a chance at being right. And so that's, that's my goal is, and, and it has to do also with human evolutionary psychology. There, Dan Sperber and Hugo Mercier have a very interesting theory about why we have logic and reason as human beings from an evolutionary point of view. They argue it's not, we didn't develop or evolve logic and reason in pursuit of truth. They were, they're not tools that we evolved so that we could see the truth or, or reason toward the truth. Instead, they said, we're a social species. We survive by cooperating together. And we develop logic and reason as social tools, tools for social manipulation. We're trying to bring down a woolly, go ahead, go ahead. Lies for the greater good. Lies for the greater good, but, but also persuasion. So as a group, for example, maybe uh, I can't bring down that woolly mammoth by myself. I need, I need you know, a few dozen of us guys together to work on it. But now there's a question, how are, we gonna, how are we gonna coordinate? How are we gonna do this? Well, I've got an idea and I need to persuade you that my idea is the right way to bring down that woolly mammoth. So I need to persuade you about that. And so what they claim is our logic and reason is a tool for social persuasion to persuade others about what we already believe. We don't use logic and reason to explore the possibilities we use it to persuade people about what we already believe. That's really powerful. It, it predicts, by the way, um, what we call the confirmation bias. It predicts that you're going to look for evidence that supports what you already believe. And that's, that's, that's been well established in lots of experiments. Human logic and reasoning, we have a confirmation bias. We always sort of discount the data that, that discredits what we believe. And we look for the, the data that, that supports what we believe. And, and so we, we see that in politics, every you know, the, the different political um, spectrum, you, know, you, you go to your corner of the political spectrum and you, you just focus on the data that, that supports what you believe. Same thing in, in religions, you, you get into a religious group and then you, you use groupthink. This, this leads to groupthink in which you, you just look for the data that supports what you already believe. And that, of course, is really bad for progress. So the reason, one reason I think that religions have been saying the same thing for thousands of years is not because they're right. I think they, they might have some insights, but they're saying the same thing because of groupthink and the fact that our logic and reason is, be, is not a tool for finding the truth, but for persuading others about what we already believe. So science comes in now. Here's where science and, and theology get together. <clears throat> Scientists are every bit as dogmatic as anybody in religious circles. Scientists are just people. <clears throat> but the thing that science has is this wonderful social requirement. To do science, to be part of the social team of scientists, 
You have to give us theories that are mathematically precise, that make predictions that are testable. You need to tell us what, what experiment we can do to show you wrong. If you want to do science, you have to do that. And that, so what you do is you pit dogmatic scientists against each other. No, most scientists aren't trying to disprove their own theories. They're trying to disprove the other guy's theory, the other scientist's theories. And so that's what scientists does, what science does. It takes this foible of human nature that we have logic and reason evolved it just to support what we already believe. And it takes that foible of human reason, pits dogmatic scientists against each other, and then we get the phoenix of science arising from the foibles of human nature. What I want in a neurotheology is the same thing about the spiritual questions. Get out of groupthink, get out of beliefs that just keep you stuck in one thing for thousands of years, be open to being wrong, and start to be precise about what we're saying about the deepest questions. Why are we here? What is this all about? What is good? What is, what is wrong? Why is there pain? To try to be absolutely precise about these things, mathematically precise, and start to do experiments and start to make progress. So I think we can do that, and that both science and spirituality will benefit from that interaction. I would definitely agree. I would say they can't be the same level of dogmatic because disproving your theory doesn't take away your eternal life. But that's a, that's a whole nother story, n neither for here nor there. I've heard, an, I've heard an interesting theory on a, a purpose of life. I don't remember who said it, but it was something to the effect of the why are we here is to find your purpose and share it with others. And I think that's a good place to start wrapping things up because it's hard to get better than that. Don, yes. if you were going to leave people with one thing, a quote, a call to action, before you tell them where to find you in your new book, what would it be and why? Um, be open to being wrong, explore other ideas, and think out of the box. It's much more fun than knowing that you're right. <laughs> I like it. Spoken like a true scientist and thinker. Go prove yourself wrong and figure something out, Don. Where can people find out about Case Against Reality? So, yes, my book, The Case Against Reality, is being published by Norton in the U.S., and it's coming out August 13th, so you can get it on Amazon or Apple Books. It's also coming out in the U.K. with Penguin, and it'll be available in Amazon U.K. as well. So it's already available for, for pre-order. And I have a web page. If you just Google Donald Hoffman, H-O-F-F-M-A-N, and uh, my, my homepage is one of the first things that comes up. I've got links to all of my publications and podcasts and videos, most of them free. So... And if you guys are going to buy it, make sure you pre-order it so it spikes the algorithm and Don's book gets ranked even higher on Amazon's bestseller list. Thanks for coming on, Don. Thanks so much, Matt. And if you guys have enjoyed this, explore the consciousness, build something great. And until next time, we'll see you soon. Cheers. Cheers.